There's a lot in the news today. According to their website, Rivian apparently has ditched LiDAR, and Elon Musk says the new version 9 of the Autopilot software is going to be out soon. It's going to be a major step change from the previous version and will be available to many more Tesla owners. And the auto dealer lobby in my home state of Georgia are trying to unfairly kill competition, probably because they know they can't win in a fair fight. Let's find out all about these latest developments. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. After the amazing SpaceX Starship serial number 10 launch and landing yesterday evening, check it out up here if you haven't seen it yet, it's pretty amazing, including the awesome explosion at the end. Things seem to be looking up for Elon and his companies. This episode, by the way, is going to be a speculative episode. In other words, don't expect all the numbers right in front of my fingers. I'm just having fun thinking about now and thinking about the future. In other words, if you just like me talking, this is going to be a good one. If you like to have me like reading off spreadsheets and stuff, this is probably not your favorite episode. So judge for yourself whether you want to continue watching. So let's start with the ridiculous news that the Georgia automaker lobbyists are pushing really hard to get the state to pass bills, forcing us consumers to purchase cars only through dealers. So first of all, where did this come from? Because there are a lot of laws in the United States about people having to purchase cars only through dealers and not through the original auto manufacturer. It turns out this came about in the 1930s. Basically what would happen is that, let's say a company like GM that was around then, there would be dealerships that would spring up everywhere. They would put together their wares and they would start up a business and everything would work well. And if the auto manufacturer saw that things were working well in a particular area, they would move across the street from that dealership and start to sell cars themselves. So basically if you've watched it happen in the United States, every time a Walgreens get put up in one corner, a CVS is definitely going up in the corner across the street from them. But basically the small business owners cried foul. They said, wait a second, we can't have you guys waiting to see if we're successful. And then if it's, there's a successful place, you know, a location that's really good, we're just going to move in and sell the cars ourselves. And they could potentially sell the cars for less, of course, than the dealership was selling it for too, because they cut out the middleman. So that's the historical context for all of this. But in the current situation, no auto manufacturer really care at all about the consumer. Ultimately, what they're doing is they're selling cars to the dealerships, at which point the dealerships just have to deal with it. Now, there's some incentives and things like that that auto manufacturers give to the dealerships to, for selling a certain number of cars per quarter or something, but really the manufacturer's consumer is the auto dealership. And then the auto dealership has to take care of the inventory somehow, they have to get rid of it. So anyway, as you can probably figure, this is an incredibly inefficient system. There's a middleman who's in the middle and you've got one person selling to another and then another selling to the consumer. And it's even worse than a situation like, um, you know, if you take Walmart or something, Walmart is a middleman for sure, right? There's a company that might sell like Morningstar Farms, might sell their veggie sauce sausages to Walmart that then sells it to the consumer. But it's part of a sort of panoply of different things that they're selling. Whereas the auto dealership system is the kind of monopolistic control of the middle. So right, I could go not just to Walmart, but to Aldi and to Kroger and to many other grocery stores and purchase Morningstar Farms goods. The problem is that for a given geographical area, the auto dealership has monopolized this particular brand. So if I'm interested in a GM or something, I have to go to this dealership unless I want to drive multiple miles away or kilometers away to go to another dealership. So they have geographical monopolies and that's not a good thing. Furthermore, of course, the auto dealership model is very, very inefficient now. Now that we've got the internet and things like that, and of course used cars is a whole different thing. You can do Carvana or something like that in the United States and I'm sure there are similar ones in other countries. But basically, you can purchase a car through looking online, you find a car that you're interested in, you can test drive it if you wish to, or you don't even have to, then you can purchase it online, and everything more or less gets taken care of without you even needing to go to the dealership itself. And so with new companies like Tesla, like Rivian, like Lucid, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they have showrooms, not dealerships. And so essentially, you're purchasing your car from Tesla or another rival EV manufacturer. It's mostly EVs these days because mm, I don't think anybody is starting up an ICE 
car manufacturing business right now. But anyway, so the, the EV companies don't have a dealership network, so they sell directly to the consumer, which makes the car cheaper because they're not having to pay the dealership and the dealership doesn't have to have its giant parking lot and its big building and its many employees, et cetera, et cetera, that are working there. Now, you could say that the showroom is partially that as well, and it is, and so that does increase some inefficiency, but it's still drastically less than the dealership model primarily because there's only a few showrooms in the United States. And so there's, you know, you go to the showroom and you look at it, but there's not a showroom every, every few miles or every small town or something. So anyway, all of this is fine, right? There's no big deal if the dealership model wants to exist and the direct to consumers model wants to exist, especially for a car manufacturer that doesn't have any showrooms. The problem is that these lobbies are coming in and trying to kill the competition. Of course, what they're arguing for is job protection. That's always what they say. They're like, you can't have this happen because all these jobs will disappear. Well, I'm sorry, going to an auto dealership is one of the worst experiences that I have in my life. I mean, the, the times that I've done it, and I've had to do it a lot of times, it's torture. It takes hours and hours and hours. It's horribly annoying. You feel like you're getting ripped off constantly. You have to be an expert negotiator, and there's a whole bunch of other things that go on. So it's a super unpleasant experience. And of course, you know that you're paying for these people who are not really giving you anything. You could purchase the car directly from the manufacturer for less money than you're purchasing it from the dealership. Or sometimes you actually might not be in that situation. You might be able to get it less than you could purchase it from the dealership due to end of quarter issues and such. But it's still just a nightmare. It's like, <laughs> I'm not a great negotiator, so I know I'm getting screwed every time I walk into a dealership. So anyway, what I'm saying here is not that there shouldn't be any dealerships suddenly, but that whoever is the most competitive, who can win on their own merits, should win. So therefore, we should have free competition. The irony, of course, is that the Georgia legislature, the Georgia governor, etc. are all Republicans, and Republicans in the United States are the conservative party of small government and no intervention and free market approach, etc., etc., apparently until it comes to people who give them a lot of money as lobbyists and have a powerful lobby in the state. At any rate, I certainly hope that the legislature does the right thing and just says, no, people can sell cars direct to the consumer if they want to. That would be the forward-looking way of thinking about this, and they should definitely do that, and then they let whoever wins, wins, right? My fear, of course, is that they won't. And the situation is really weird. I think essentially what you can do is you can purchase the car from out of state and then transfer the license to in-state. So as long as there's any states nearby that allow direct to consumer sales, you can, so if I live in Georgia and Alabama allows direct to consumer sales, officially I could be purchasing the car from Alabama and then there's an immediate title switch to Georgia. Georgia still gets its tax money and everything, but it's a stupid system. And really the legislature should do the right thing and they should allow competition to happen. And if the dealership model dies, that's okay, right? It's not an efficient thing and it's not survivable. If it does survive, maybe they can change the way that they work and make it more pleasant and more economically efficient, in which case, great, they get to survive too. All right, enough about my bitching about the whole <laughs> dealership model. I really, really don't like auto dealerships. So what about Rivian's current lack of LiDAR on their website and their promotional sites? In 2019, it was a really big deal that they had LiDAR. And in fact, they had two LiDARs. But by late 2020, and I'm only just discovering this now, by the way, the statements about LiDAR as part of their full self-driving package had disappeared from their website. So what does this mean for Rivian, for Tesla, for Mobileye, for Waymo, for Comma AI, and all the others who are playing in the AI full self-driving arena? Well, first of all, I think we have to contextualize this because there was L3 and L4 autonomy statements from Rivian back in 2019. Those statements have disappeared. So now it's advanced driver assistance features, right? So it's become something a little bit less. It looks to be much more like GM's cruise because if you look on their website, it specifically says works on certain roads now and will be working on more and more roads in the future. So again, that's much more like GM. That's like if they've created high definition maps of an area, you're allowed to drive on there with the full self-driving package. If not, then they don't let you do that. And so it'll turn on and off based on where you are. Of course, this is completely different than what Tesla is doing because Tesla is saying, we're just gonna throw it out there. They don't create predefined high resolution maps. You do it on the fly as you drive around. So basically any road that it's capable of driving on, including things like dirt roads and so forth, are acceptable places to attempt to drive with full self-driving. And by the way, I'm talking about the beta, right? Obviously the version that's out for me and most of the consumer public for, from Tesla is the 
I don't know, they're both betas, but <laughs> the old beta version. So that one only allows you to drive on sort of marked roads and so forth. And it does stop at lights and things, but it doesn't do like left-hand turns and all of that. But anyway, we're gonna talk more about the new, new beta in just a minute. So anyway, it appears that Rivian has backed off on their statements about what their full self-driving or autonomous driving uh, capabilities are going to be. But beyond that, in some discussions that were going on on Rivian chat boards around the time, this was November of 2020, people are also talking about how LiDAR is kind of flaky, and also if they're using this sort of GM system of pre-mapping these roads, they can send somebody out to do the high resolution mapping separately, which really obviates the need for LiDAR. The one place that I feel like, and I did an episode about this, where you might need LiDAR is flat objects that are in the road. This is very unusual, but think about a semi truck that has crashed and turned over so that it's facing flat towards the car. This is a situation where Teslas can actually impact the car because of the way that the, the, the software works. It just doesn't see that as something in the way. It actually probably interprets it as a road sign, right? Because a road sign is a big flat thing, but it's above the road. <laughs> so that's above the road, this thing's on the road. And so it kind of doesn't realize until the last second when the radar gets close enough that it's like, oh crap, that's actually like in the road. Then it, once it, it differentiates that, it attempts to stop, but it can fail and it can crash. So that's a really, really weird case. And I'm very curious to find out what happens with the beta software software about that, but there's it's a pretty minimal use case for LiDAR. And so everybody else who's working on LiDAR solutions, you know, it's it may not be that necessary. And as Elon Musk says, it's a crutch and it makes you feel like you've gotten further with full self-driving than you actually have. So Rivian may have decided that that's the case. Number one, they've backed off on their full self-driving everywhere promise. And as long as they can pre-map all of the areas, they can go ahead and do the sort of GM version of full self-driving. And then of course, if their software gets better, they can then move on to more of Tesla's model. They do have quite the sensor suite. They have more or less what Tesla has, but they have five radars instead of only one, which is pretty amazing. They've got, I guess it's just all around it. It's like a blanket of radars all around it. But anyway, that's interesting news from Rivian. I'll be curious to see if companies like Lucid or other companies decide before their models come out. It'll be an interesting validation of what Tesla has been saying for a long time if other companies start to get rid of LiDAR as well. Speaking of full self-driving, let's talk about the new beta in just a second. But first, if you enjoyed this episode, please do like it so other people can find it and definitely subscribe for more of this. Also, a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. You are wonderful. And it's really helpful. The people who did the live stream last night, it was great. Thank you so much for helping on Discord with managing the live stream. It makes it go so much better and look so much more quality. Also, a big thank you to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music. And of course, don't forget about our merch store, which has all input is error, a plaid Tesla logo, and a many, many other things. So definitely check it out and see what you can find there and you can help the channel out. And finally, don't forget that we are Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you click a link, you go shopping, you help out the channel. It's that simple. Thank you. All right. And finally today, something to get really excited about. Elon Musk has teased that version nine of the full self-driving or enhanced navigate on autopilot beta will be out soon as in next month and will be much better and much more widely available. So first of all, Elon Musk says the next version is going to be a step change from the last version, which means it's going to be a major difference. As far as I can tell, and I've done some episodes on this, so definitely check them out, the difference is going to be that the old or current version has deep neural networks as sort of the center of the Hydronet software that they're using, but it's surrounded by a C++ kind of hard-coded code base. And I guess the step change, I can't believe that they're confident enough to do this, but this is really cool, is they're going to replace the entire software stack with deep neural network based models that by the way are 4d so that means that they're not only going to stitch together all the camera views but they're going to do it temporarily now that is true for some of the software stack currently in the new version that you know the few people the few the proud the lucky are driving right now so it's true that some of that is based on that but apparently this new version software 9 is going to completely replace all the old c code with deep neural networks and part of that means that it will now all be 4d or time-based what does that mean for full self-driving capability? Well, it means it should be immensely better. There should be a significant 
bump in the quality of the full self-driving beta from the current version to the new version. Obviously, we'll have to wait till the people who are driving this beta have a chance to test it out and tell us whether that's true. But according to Elon Musk, he's already driving a lot of this software, and he says it's basically no intervention all the time. And of course, the other piece of awesome news that goes along with this is he says it's going to be much more widely released. So I'm really hoping that people, at least people in the United States who have the full self-driving package, will have a high degree of likelihood of getting the new software. Of course, I feel bad for people in other countries right now, but it seems like what Tesla's trying to do is get it all working properly in the U.S. first and then start to expand the distribution to other countries. Now, of course, Elon also tweeted that they're going to have to be exceptionally careful about how they roll this out. You have to think about this. They first picked very, very few people who are exceptionally careful drivers. And of course they have records of how all of us drive. So hopefully I'm a reasonably careful driver. Anyway, they picked people that they knew were really, really good and that were going to beta test it well. And they gave it only to them. And they've obviously been working on improving it and so forth. But this next release, if it goes out to a much larger group is going to go from 99th percentile drivers with a great deal of experience driving a Tesla to potentially like 80th percentile drivers and above or something, right? So there's gonna be a much more wide group of people. I'm sure they're not gonna give it to the folks who uh, have been on you know, on camera like sleeping in the car or something while their first self-driving is working. I'm sure they won't give it to them yet, but um, they're gonna give it to many, many more people and so the risk is that you're going to have people who are not as careful and not as aware of what's going on. And all it's going to take is one accident or God forbid, if there's one fatality with this, uh, you know, a bad accident or something. If that happens, it's going to go really bad for Tesla. The public opinion will sway the other direction. Doesn't matter if they've done millions and millions of miles. And if, of course, like every day, probably while I've been recording this video, there have been multiple fatalities on U.S. roads. So obviously fatalities happen on the roads, but if it happens in a Tesla and if there's any chance that it was the new full self-driving software, it'll be a firestorm of negative press. So it would be really bad for Tesla. So I'm sure also, of course, they care about their consumers and they don't want somebody to get hurt or die. But all of that wrapped together means that they have to be super careful and they have to be really, really conservative about exactly how they release this and how each of the versions gets introduced and who they give it to. So I do understand their need to be careful, but I'm also really, really hoping <laughs> please Tesla, that they can give it out to a lot more people and that hopefully I and many of the other people who are my fans will be able to get a hold of this software and test it out ourselves. By the way, what I'm really, really hoping for is I'm planning a trip either in late May or early June to go out to Giga Texas, Tesla's factory that's being developed, and also to Boca Chica and try to watch a Starship launch, which would be awesome. But I'm hoping that during that trip, which I will be recording and blogging and you know uploading YouTube videos and such, uh, that during that trip, I can drive the new beta software. So that's, that's my goal. As long as I get it before like May, it'll be fantastic. So anyway, we will see, but here's hoping. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, again, don't forget to like and subscribe. And in the meantime, please do ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Until next time. Bye-bye.